Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 274, The Chronology Protectorate Agent, read by Alan V. Hare. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, if no one shows up for your time travel party, it might not mean what you think. The sign on the door said, Dr. Caroline Rutherford, Department Head, Theoretical Physics. I stood there staring at it. When had I gotten there, and how? It was as if I had just woken up before the door. Where had I been just a minute before? I was drawing a blank. I didn't know. Had there even been a before? It was obvious there was. I mean, an adult human doesn't just randomly manifest out of thin air outside an office door. As far as I know, the universe doesn't work that way. But why am I so sure of that? Looking down, my left hand held an envelope addressed to the person named on the sign, suggesting my sudden materialization was not accidental. Doing the only thing that came to mind, I knocked on the door. Come in, a woman responded almost immediately. Tentatively, I opened the door to find a middle-aged woman sitting behind a desk. Her salt-and-pepper hair framed a face etched by too many hours spent reading research papers. Her curious blue eyes were fixed intently on an old-fashioned computer terminal. She stopped reading and stared at me as if saying, I don't have time for this. You better come in. Sit and tell me what this is about. I have work to do and five other grad students to meet with today, she snapped. There was only one chair, which was generally used as a bookshelf, judging from the haphazard piles on the floor beside it. Careful not to knock over a stack, I sat and tried to collect my thoughts, hoping something would trigger a useful memory so I would know why I was there. We looked at each other in awkward silence for a moment. I know it can be intimidating talking to a department head, but you could start by telling me your name. The woman, presumably Dr. Rutherford, suggested. Up to that moment, I hadn't thought about my name, and for an instant, I was afraid I didn't remember it. But Emile Durand rolled off my lips. Well, Emile, what's so urgent that you couldn't make an appointment? I'm... I'm not sure exactly, I admitted, a vague sense of a recent trauma guiding my words. I think I was involved in an accident. There was a flash and noise, sort of like something exploded. The next thing I remember is standing outside your office door. Dr. Rutherford looked alarmed. So you're here to report a lab accident, then? Are you okay? You should have gone to the infirmary first. The report can wait. No, I'm okay. I'm not hurt. Clearly, you're not okay, Rutherford asserted. I must insist you seek medical attention. I don't think that would help. Why? Because... I hesitated. Because I think I'm dead. I've got this overwhelming sense my body was destroyed. Everything is mixed up except... except that I am supposed to be here. You must have hit your head. Dr. Rutherford insisted. That's why your thinking is so muddled. You need to get checked out. Please, give me a bit more time, I pleaded. My mind's beginning to clear. For example, your office. It looks... It looks like an old video. Why are you using such an antiquated computer terminal? I've only seen those in photos. Old? She questioned indignantly, staring at me with her intense blue eyes. The IT department just bought me that new desktop a month ago. It's supposed to be top of the line and brand new, she explained defensively. And you're too solid looking to be a ghost. Most people describe them as translucent or ephemeral wispy shapes. Besides, there's no scientific evidence for their existence, and if you tell me you're an alien instead, I'll kick you out right now, regardless of whether you're injured or not. There are over six billion smartphones in the world. 
that means 6 billion high-quality cameras that take photos with incredible detail. There are excellent pictures of every inch of the planet, and not one showing a supposed ghost or UFO that isn't more than a blurry smudge. The existence of ghosts is even less likely than time travel. At least time travel has a scientific basis for being possible, however improbable. Although I predict the theories that support it will eventually be proven wrong. Time. Travel. I repeated slowly. A half-remembered experience condensing out of the mists of confusion at its mention. I... I think I remember being in a machine shaped like a giant, polished metal spiral. I managed to choke out. There was so much energy around that it felt like ants were crawling across my skin. Then there was a flash and suddenly my body was torn apart, the pain so intense I blacked out. When I came to, I was standing in front of your office door, and the pain was gone. And you can't remember anything else? I nodded. Okay, I'm going to do a search for you in the database. It will tell me what program you're in and who your thesis advisor is. Then I'll get them over here to help you. Is that okay? I nodded again thinking Rutherford was beginning to suspect I was an escapee from a psych experiment gone wrong. But for now, she wasn't going to kick me out of her office, which would afford me a bit more time to figure out why I needed to be there. After a few minutes, Dr. Rutherford frowned and looked confused. She glanced from whatever she had found on her terminal to me, then back again. You were a graduate student in mathematics, but... She hesitated. That was 75 years ago. She twisted the terminal's monitor around so I could read the search result. Emile Duran, doctoral candidate, applied mathematics, incomplete. It was the date that stood out, 1964. I was stunned. That confirms it. I've got to be a ghost. The accident must have happened years ago, I reasoned. Rutherford spun the screen back toward her, typed in another search, and then scan the results. There's no obituary, but there is this. She swung the screen around again. A browser window was opened to a story clipped from a newspaper with the headline, Promising Graduate Student Disappears Without a Trace. I still don't believe in ghosts, Dr. Rutherford restated firmly, examining me like a microbe on a glass slide. You must have seen that name someplace. Maybe on the way here, the older buildings are plastered with past students' names and photos. You must have seen that name, and it's stuck in your mind. I can't deny that. I just don't remember, I admitted. It made more sense than being a ghost. Yet Rutherford's conjecture that I was a student with a head injury seemed somehow wrong. Something was missing. As Dr. Rutherford continued to search the records, I looked around her office for the first time. Papers and equations lay strewn about. My eyes wandered past bookshelves filled with scientific tomes until I caught sight of a calendar carefully taped to the wall between two framed posters of bright nebulae. On it, a vivid red circle had been drawn with a felt marker around a specific date, a date I instantly recognized. It burrowed into my mind, unearthing new memories which began to flow into my consciousness. Oh, I moaned and closed my eyes, clutching my head in pain. Are you okay? Dr. Rutherford asked with genuine concern. You're not. Don't deny it. Look, I'm going to call security to take you to the infirmary. No, please, don't. I was just overwhelmed for a second. I'm okay now. Really, I am. I had just opened my eyes as Dr. Rutherford began tapping numbers on an ancient black desk phone when a new thought condensed into my mind. Tell me, how did your party go last year? Did anyone show up? I asked. Shocked, she froze, then put the handset back into its cradle. How did you know about that? The date circled on the calendar, I explained. It's the 25th anniversary of Stephen Hawking's famous party for time travelers at Cambridge. You restaged it a year ago, and today, Today, you were going to write the invitations for it and announce it to the world. Just like Hawking's did. Maybe that's why I'm here. 
Ah, so the plot thickens. You've only been pretending to have amnesia, Rutherford accused. And now you're hinting that you're a time traveler rather than a ghost? So why show up now? Why not at my party to prove I'm wrong and prove time travel is real? Who in the faculty learned about my restaging of the Hawking's experiment, and how did they find out about it? I've meticulously kept it secret until the invitations are out. No one told me. When I saw the calendar date, Dr. Rutherford, I realized I had to be here today, and if I wasn't, the future wouldn't unfold properly. If you tell me why you restaged the Hawking Party experiment, maybe that will trigger more of my memory. On one condition, she said after a few moments of silence. When I'm done, you'll come clean and tell me the truth. Okay, I nodded. She leaned back in her chair, steepled her hands and stared at me like she wasn't sure she wanted to say anything more. Then she sighed and finally began to explain. We're having an argument in the department about the possibility of time travel. Some of the younger researchers are convinced closed time-like curves exist. They're the world lines in a Lorentzian manifold of a particle in space-time. Incomprehension must have been written across my face. Rutherford groaned and launched into a simplified explanation. It's a theoretical structure where space-time folds back on itself and creates a closed loop, which means it returns to its starting point. She waited for me to grasp the importance of her statement, but when I simply stared at her, she sighed again. Which means it would be possible to travel back in time. If you're a time traveler, you should be familiar with the theory, she added sarcastically. Anyway, the younger researchers argue that no time traveler showed up at Hawking's party because his invitations were lost and forgotten before a time machine was invented. Even Hawking admitted that could have happened, so his party was not definitive proof that time travel would never be plausible. So, in secret, I staged the experiment again and was about to write the invitations to the party on its first anniversary when you walked in. The experiment won't be complete until I do that. If I don't write the invitation and send it out, then the absence of guests a year ago doesn't prove anything, right? Unlike Hawking, I will send them to every library and archive worldwide, so the chance of it disappearing is minimal. I don't want to give you a spoiler, but it's not looking so good for closed light-like loops because I am determined to follow through. How about faster than light travel? I suggested, already knowing how she would answer. Ditto, unless you can go back in time and change the miserable turnout at my party. Let's just say I had way too much champagne for one person and finally got bored of celebrating by myself. I don't understand why one of my younger time-travel-believing colleagues didn't get you to show up a year ago. It was a good champagne, and I would have looked like I had lost the argument, at least until I figured out they had fooled me. A sudden, intense pain at the back of my head contorted my face. You're not well. You need to have that looked after, Dr. Rutherford urged. The agony passed, and I looked down at the envelope, still clutching it in my left hand, knowing I was there to deliver it. The thought was as clear as day. Here, I pushed the crumpled envelope at her. This is for you. At first, Dr. Rutherford stared at it as if it might be a sprig of poison ivy. I dropped it on her desk. It's addressed to you. I'm sure it's why I'm here. Gingerly, she fingered it picked up the soiled envelope, and looked at me questioningly. Go ahead. Open it, I encouraged. Dr. Rutherford tapped the envelope on the desk, thinking, before she shrugged and ripped it open. A folded piece of paper fell out. We both stared as it tumbled onto her desk. Even folded, it was evident that it was densely covered in hand-scrawled formulas. Dr. Rutherford looked at me for an explanation. I shrugged. Then she carefully unfolded the paper and scanned it. Her eyes grew wide. I don't understand it all, and there are a few critical parts missing, but this is... She stopped to catch her breath. This is a roadmap for how to create an artificial closed light-like loop. She looked up from the paper and stared at me.
it's a functioning time machine, but even if it works, there are still problems. Dr. Rutherford fell back into her chair. And without the missing bits, it might take several decades or generations to figure out. She dropped the paper on her desk. Where did you get that? I've never seen work like this before. I suddenly had the urge to dig in my hip pocket. Wait, I exclaimed, pulling out another piece of folded paper. Dr. Rutherford watched me like she was supervising a lab assistant perform a delicate experiment as I unfolded and read what was on the sheet. This time, the pain was so intense that I blacked out. Are you okay? A worried-looking Rutherford was looking down at me. I had fallen off my chair and was lying on the floor. Should I call for help? She asked. No, no help, I grunted, rolling onto my back and taking a deep breath. The pain was gone and all my memories had returned. I managed to prop myself up on my elbows. No, don't call anyone, I said, picking myself off the floor and returning to the chair. I'll be fine. It's over. They warned me I might not remember at first. It happens sometimes. After all, most of my memories haven't taken place yet. They can be hard to recall when one first arrives. So you're continuing to insist you're a time traveler? Dr. Rutherford accused. How would that work? I know I said the paper you gave me provides the basis for developing a closed light-like loop. But there are still problems. For example, how would you avoid running into yourself when you travel backward in time? The universe can't spontaneously generate the matter to create a second you. I disappeared around 75 years ago. Correct? I asked. That's what the record state happened to Emile Durand, Dr. Rutherford confirmed, skepticism evident in her tone. But I thought we had covered that already. You're not Emile. But I am. And the answer is simple, I scoffed. I can't travel back before the date I disappeared. Dr. Rutherford considered this. So, if time travel exists like you are claiming, why did no one attend Hawking's party? You were on the right track about his invitations. They didn't survive, at least not in their original form. We changed the GPS location on his invitations just in case someone in the future was crazy enough to go. The Chronology Protectorate, the governing time travel body, is strict about letting people travel back before time travel was invented. If you go back before that point in history, then you are stuck in the past until time travel exists. It's a catch-22. But there are always a few reckless people who don't care, so the Protectorate took no chances with Hawking's party. And my party? Rutherford asked indignantly. Why did no time traveler show up at my party? Well, I'm here and you haven't written your invitations yet. So you're going to stop me? I smiled and shook my head. No, that's still up to you and you make the right decision. This other piece of paper, I dangled it before Rutherford, contains the missing equations in your letter. I'm here to offer you a deal. You and I, in a few years, are going to create a functioning time machine. We become famous and get a Nobel for it. What if I refuse? She objected. Did anyone show up at your party? No, Rutherford admitted reluctantly. Then there's your answer. You don't. You can help us create original content twice a month by heading over to ko-fi.com slash makeshift stories and making a one-time donation or becoming an ongoing supporter at patreon.com slash makeshift stories. I'd like to thank those listeners who have recently supported us. Your contributions really help us out. Hey everyone, this is where we recommend new podcasts we think you'd love. Looters is an actual play podcast and they're doing a Halloween special this month.
This Halloween, the looters are facing their fears. Now I have that fear. Now Dude, I'm, like I, I'm realizing I'm yeah. scared of everything. You just unlocked my new fear. I live in a constant state of anxieties. With Deanna Nuval. Mm, spiders. Melinda Macklem. I feel like I say I'm fine with heights until I actually am up high. And special guests. Tina Wong Lu. Wait, I'm scared of a head-on collision. And Madeline Hours. Episiotomies. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but these final girls are dead set on getting out alive. Never separate from the group. Don't go upstairs. No camping. Join us on October 24th and the 31st for the final final girls. A horrifying two-part special with Game Master Andrew Gauntlet. Uh, boo. Lock your doors. Check your back seats. And tune into the Looters feed wherever you get your podcasts. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written and read by Alan V. Hare. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything. <laughs>